Hi, thanks for coming. So this was uh, billed confusingly as a fireside chat uh, between uh, the narrative designer of 80 Days and the writer of Heaven's Vault. Um, it really isn't. It's really, I'm going to ask her questions. So, if I, if so he I, says, wait until I have a wrong opinion, then we'll see. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll just pull a face. Um, so uh, obviously, I'm sure you all are here because you know who Meg is. Uh, she was the writer and the narrative designer. She did both on 80 Days. Uh, which was a game made by my company, Inkle, about five years ago, which is really far too long ago. I don't want to talk about just 80 days, because we've no. talked about it a lot. In, a lot. In fact, on this stage. Yes, fact, indeed. Yeah. Exactly. And that was a good chat, it and I wouldn't want to do a worse one. Um, but I thought, <laughs> for, my, for my first question, I wanted to ask you something... I wanted to ask you something entirely he from my... He hasn't actually told me this, you know, so... Yeah, this right. isn't I'm, I'm actually this excited. Is... Oh, my God. Yeah. No. Well, you might just be like, this is a terrible question. Why are <laughs> yeah. you asking no, Absolutely. Just critique um, your questions instead of getting... All right, let's stop building it up and get on with it. Um, <laughs> so uh, this is a question that I wanted yeah. to ask you kind of personally, because mm. it's something I've never actually asked you. Um, and so I thought doing it in public would be a great idea. Um, <laughs> so five years ago, it's 2014. Mm. Yeah. You've left your job at the BBC, which is where you are working. It was made redundant, yes. Oh, I'm sorry, <clears throat> my, my apologies. Yeah, exactly. um, and you've worked in various kind of game-adjacent projects. Mm -hmm. We worked actually together on something. Um, <laughs> oh, God, we did. <laughs> let's be nice. Um, <laughs> and uh, but, and done a little bit of work on an independent game, yeah. Samsara, which mm -hmm. I, I remember playing. But you hadn't really oh, done a big... You sent me a note about it, in fact. It I liked it. Little... No, I liked it. Yeah. Um, but you hadn't really done a game project of your own. No. Uh, then you're approached by a scrappy little startup with no money who <laughs> ask you to write something really large but don't really pay you properly. <laughs> Um, for which I apologise. Oh, uh, yeah, no, definitely. They pay you. I mean... It's fine now. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't <Yes>. then. <laughs> um, what did you think was going to happen? Um, I thought eight people were going to play it. I thought, And I really thought that was why you allowed me all of this freedom, because I think I did a bunch of really... You sort of... As I recall, I wrote a writing... So I met you. Hmm. I got extremely excited. Um, you know, spent like, I think it was like two weeks over that summer of like 2013, was it maybe? Mm. You know, doing this this sort of overcomplicated writing sample in Suez, the camel races, mm. and like this hot air balloon. Entirely unpaid, I'm like, <laughs> Entirely like, we, unpaid. We do pay obviously. for writing tests now. Yeah, exactly. Didn't, <laughs> paid for your writing test writers. <laughs> yeah, you really should. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yep. This <clears throat> bit of a rule now. But, um, Sorry. It, no, no. <laughs> it was a different time five years ago. I think it was a learning experience for all of us. But yeah, anyway, I think it was also the first time you had hired someone to write externally at the Trusted company. is the word. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember what you told me at the launch party? No, I don't. <laughs> at the 80 Days launch party, John took me aside, and I think we were both quite tipsy by this point, and we were outside, and I think I was having a cigarette, and you said, oh, Meg, actually, you know, when I hired you, I thought I was going to have to rewrite everything, <laughs> and I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I, it was a compliment. No, 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 it's sure. A very Johnny and compliment. I only had to rewrite about half of it. Um, <gasps> so anyway, what? <laughs> oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I'm channeling my Craig from Strictly Come Dancing. <laughs> um, so anyway, I feel like this is more Elias supervisor <laughs> in Heaven's Vault. Oh, well, you know what? I, I'd love to be an academic. I'm just not. A commercially academic, yes, really? Yeah, no, I think no, it's my really. It, Shocking. It's not about me. Um, so you, yes, you so, thought eight people yeah, were going to yeah, play Yeah, it. well, so, I mean, and the thing is, I came on board, and I, I remember because initially you guys wanted me to do just a very small amount of writing, and the rest you were going to generate procedurally. <laughs> as you recall. <laughs> uh, and so actually, like, what turned out to be the minimum viable project initially was sort of meant to be oh, yeah, like, you know, we'll do that, and then maybe we'll add that again. And I think mm. it was about three months' worth of work. And, and I think we then ended up doing another year of writing on it. Something like that. Something yeah. like that. But, but I remember also that, um, you know, I was just kind of writing these, like, flavorful... Not very, like, not very much was happening. And I remember, you, like, waiting for the pushback. <laughs> I remember sort of waiting for you to say, like, oh, Meg, maybe let's do... And you never did. And I thought, oh, right, that's because they're focused on sorcery. They're probably, they're probably just, like, have given up on this. Mm. And they're just letting me do whatever. And but, you carried, but you carried on going. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. I was enjoying myself. Right, yeah. <laughs> like, I, you know, where, where do you really get a chance to kind of do exactly what, what you want to do? And, and I remember, I, I think I worked on it for about 
Was it about three months before you guys shifted from sorcery onto mm, HD? I think it was about six months, actually. I remember a <laughs> really? long period of silence in which Joe would say, is Meg still doing anything? And I would say, I don't know. <laughs> oh, no, see, I guess there was, a, there was a kind of initial three month period where I was getting up to speed with ink and I look back and I realised that, oh, yeah, when I learned how to weave, that was a big step change in, yes. in being it. So, so I was kind of, I hadn't worked in, in ink before as well, which is the scripting language. Um, <clears throat> But yeah, so I think I think I, through development, I just thought this is going to be a labor of love. It's going to be really great. It's going to be really niche mm. and eight people will play it. But those eight people will love it. And so, that's so going to be enough for would me. Would it be fair to say that you were working from kind of the desire to see what you could make rather than kind of to make a I, portfolio? I think, it, yeah, I think I just I think as well, you know, the story 80 days. It's so. I really just, I went in, I wanted to rewrite Alda. I wanted to make, I, you know, yeah, I, I knew this was, this was kind of, it was so weird. It felt so perfect. It aligned with kind of every one of my interests, history, historical fiction, um, steampunk and rewriting steampunk. Mm. I think I have a weird affinity for genres that I actually dislike in a way. I dislike most of steampunk that's out there. There's lots of really great steampunk out there. You kind of have to go find it, the multicultural stuff. Um, you know, and I, I don't really like, Fantasy, either necessarily. You tried to put a dragon in 80 days, and I'm still upset I did about put that. Dragon in 80 days. <laughs> no, there's no dragon. It's an enormous mechanical lizard. It's a fire breathing uh. dinosaur. <laughs> <laughs> I have anyway. A anyway, that's a whole different matter. That's a five year old argument. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, no, so I think I, think I you know, and I, I wanted to make it anti colonial, and, it, and I, you know, and it was about the way British people see the world. And I have a lot to say about that, I think, as someone who's Indian, um, but also grew up here as well. So yeah, it just, it kind of, it all made sense to me. And I knew what I wanted to do with it, even if I don't think I, I articulated it to myself. It just, it all just kind of seemed to fall together. It felt like a kind of natural thing yeah. to be doing. So obviously you've done a ton of writing <laughs> yeah. since that. I mean, no, pretty... still not as much. I think overall, <laughs> the amount of writing I've done in the rest of my career still doesn't quite compare to the probably half a million <laughs> words yeah, on 80 okay. days. All right, so it was something of a boot camp. Yeah. Um, but I guess since finishing it, you mm -hmm. must have, I mean, you've, you must have had a lot of time to reflect on yeah. your process and refine your process. So when you talk about 80 days, you often talk about the themes and kind of what you wanted to use the story to represent yes. or to discuss or to kind of alter. I've, I don't often hear you talk about the characters, which is an interesting thing. Would you say that you're more driven by kind of theme and politics? Yeah, I mean, than... I, yeah, well, I think, I think that, Again, characters, I hate writing character synopses. I just don't, I think I have a weird, I'm a bit mystical about some of these things. I think the more I write about a character before I write them, the less real they are to me. And I feel like I'm, I'm kind of having to stick to these particular traits or highlights. Whereas to me, I think character emerges out of situation. I think it's something that's actually quite similar to something you, you've said to me, which is, and I, I remember this so clearly, like these, these, pieces of advice that, that kind of stick out. And it was when you were describing kind of making a choice and and the kind of multiple stages of it and the gradual nature of it. And I think it was flirting with somebody or kissing with someone that you, that you were describing. And it was just, you know, instead of just, should I kiss them or turn away? You you kept, you kept talked about the, all right, do I, you know, do I move up my chair? Do I, do I meet their eye? Do I sit a little bit closer? Do I lean forward? Do, they, do, do, do I catch their eye? Oh, and you know, and that building of kind of anticipation. And, that, and I think you also must think, maybe in response to a game that had come out recently, you, you also did say that character is about the small, smaller moments mm -hmm. rather than these big choices. And I, and I think in those ways, our ethos is a very, mm. very similar mm. because I, I think that too. And I think, I think, you know, what a person is like can't be divorced from the, the situation they're, they're in. And and the and the, the viewpoint that you're seeing them in as well, you know, Passepartout has a very particular view of, of certain people, and I think, you know, the, the richness and the depth that it feels like it has, we could also do at that scale because you only see glimpses, mm -hmm. and I think, you know, that that has its advantages and its disadvantages. I think, <clears throat> you know, John, I think you actually wrote some of the longer story chains, the ones that were more procedural, like the Black Rose storyline. Yeah, so how that, did that feel? Because I think that kind of allowed you to develop more character. Well, I, I think I, I, I'm asking the questions, but I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I think one thing I would say that I enjoyed on that project was that by the time that I came to write, you'd already done quite a lot of work, so the characters were already there mm. for me. I think it's really interesting to hear you talk about characterists 
Yeah, because you're right. There are some writers who say, I'm going to define my characters and mm. I'm going to see how they operate like little robots yeah. moving forward through the world. Yes. And there are other characters who say, well, the character, I'm going to sort of peer through this glass and try to home in on them, but you can never quite be sure yes. what people are really like. Exactly. And, right, I and that, that sounds kind of like what you're yeah, saying. Absolutely. But the, the effect of reading what you wrote, yeah. the characters obviously came through very strongly. I knew who they <laughs> were, I knew how they spoke, and yeah. I could see ways to kind of twist and, yes. and play with them. So, yeah, the Black Rose storyline has some interesting kind of developments for Fog, which was a thing I thought yeah, yeah, yeah. we never quite pulled off otherwise. Yeah, I mean, the, I think, <clears throat> yeah, you sort of see Fog, <laughs> you see Fog in Extremis, but it's really Passepartout that yes. responds. Yeah. <laughs> Fog is really calm, even as he dies horrifically in the North Pole. Spoil it. So, <laughs> um, I, I'm... I'm... <laughs> <laughs> Some oars over that <laughs> <laughs> I think in your original draft you couldn't save him either. I think that was something I fixed. Or not. No, no, no. You can't. No, no. Because I think. Um, uh, oh no, you did. No, you did. No, you did. But you wrote. You like. It was I just think excruciatingly hard. <laughs> it was. It was quite hard. Uh, yeah, I think we rebalanced it. But I think it was also because. What was it? Did, uh, you wrote a bit where he leaves the top hat on the. Ground. Oh, I just I just strung out the death sequence because <laughs> it, it was so. Good. And I was just like, really, we're going to milk it. You told me yeah. that I made you cry during. You did. You made me cry in Starbucks. I was, I was so, reading the first draft in Starbucks, and I burst into tears that. reading it, <laughs> was um, so which was really stunning, actually. Um, I'm, I mean, I cry very easily. I'm I'm not ashamed to, <laughs> but not in Starbucks. Um, <laughs> That's true. Except when my children are really annoying. <laughs> um, uh, anyway, so I yeah, I'm really interested to talk about craft though I think mm -hmm. craft craft is kind of the thing that I, I wanted to, yeah. to talk about really and so from all of that it makes it sound like so I read this thing recently when you know when people were being rude about the Game of Thrones writers recently mm, yeah um, which I've been saying for years but anyway <laughs> um, and there was an interesting analysis of that that said that where there are writers who are who are plotters and there are yes. writers who are pantsers. pantsers. You right, probably yeah, yeah. saw this. Um, the idea being a plotter plans everything out in advance and then executes it and a pantser just flies by the seat of their pants and sees what happens. And I think it's quite clear what happened with Game of Thrones. Would you say that you're more of a pantser than a plotter? I think, see, I think this is the thing. I think especially in interactive design, um, it, it, you, have to, you have to plot some things. It's about what you plot. I mean, and again, I don't think you know, the arc of the plot. So like, look at 80 Days. There's no real reason to, you don't need to spend a lot of time plotting out the the main arc because it's like all right go on a journey finish the journey yeah. <laughs> hopefully on time probably not you know and, and i actually think that's a really nice model because i think it, it's about for me i think um i need to be very very sure what kind of experience moment to moment i want the player to have and then everything else is kind of flexible around that i think mm. you know i think so because I'm working on I'm working on a game called Sable at the moment um, with the lovely folks at Shedworks and it was announced at E3 last year. It's, it's very beautiful. It looks like a Mobius comic. It's uh, it, it's actually really great because I'm just like oh wow, there's there's things other than text here. So <laughs> I <laughs> they can hide me. It's not all on you. Oh, but um, but you know it's been one of those weird processes where it's like you know what what do you define what. And I think, I think that's maybe the hardest process when you're not adapting something and when it's kind of an entirely new piece. It's the, 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 the possibility space is so mm. enormous. And I think making some decisions early on that narrow it um, are scary but necessary. And, and it's only within the narrowness and the constraints that you start to find something interesting. Mm. You know? <clears throat> and I think with 80 Days, we had a lot of those given to us mm. um, by the material. Whereas, you know, and, and I'm curious to know what, what, what it felt like on Heaven's Vault as well, because I think that that must be a similar experience to reinventing all of this. Such a beast. Um, yeah. It's <laughs> hard to uh, yeah. explain, really. I think. But I did mean, you plot? Like, I mean, I remember. So, 80 Days didn't have a single planning document apart from one list of cities and journeys that we were doing that I made. Yeah, it was cities we intended to write. We intended with to write, of most of which we did. From me going, where the bloody hell is that? And, and me going, <laughs> I'm taking, yeah, exactly. <laughs> There's quite a long list of things we didn't get to, actually. Yeah. Um, but, but, yeah, so, and I think I saw some initial documentation for Heaven's Vault, but did you, did, like, do you feel like you plotted it or pantsed it? Or, uh, I don't know about that distinction, even, I think. No, it's, well, it's a funny distinction, isn't it? Because I, I don't think I've ever met a real-life plotter, just because at some point you have to give up and prove that you can write any of this stuff. And like, it's, you can write the most outlandish plot document, but then by the end of it, how do you actually sit down and write any of it? It's so much easier to do afterwards. Mm, like yeah. I often lied, so when I'm on like, cause you know, do contract work, I will often actually just write the thing, but not send the person my written, <laughs> <laughs> right, sort of write the plot of it, send it through and be like, yeah, all right, that, that's interesting. Cause mm. I, just, I don't, 
the moment I write a plot outline, I'm almost guaranteed to never use anything in that. Mm. And uh, so it feels like it's just kind of a waste of time for me. So a question that I wrote down when I was sort of thinking about questions, because I kind of anticipated your answer to that question. <laughs> yeah. Um, you you is, have seen my process. <laughs> I, I have, yes, this is true. Um, is it even possible to plot IF? No, I don't. So I personally don't even believe in plot in, in a kind of traditional broadcast sense. I have opinions about, about plot. I, don't, I, I think that endings are of a lot less importance in games in general. You know, if you look at the statistics of how many people get to the end of a game, it's very, very few. It's, yeah. So, you know, if your entire narrative makes sense, you can't make the sixth sense in a video game, even though people try to again and again. Some, like a, a video game narrative that only works if you see the end has already failed, I think. Mm. I mean... Strong words. Strong I, I, I entirely yeah. agree. I mean, you say that, but then I'm, I'm probably going to play Death Stranding and just be like, you know what? The go but I don't actually, think that's going to make any sense. You, you say that, but <laughs> I, I'm so excited about it. Really, like, it actually sounds like perfect. If I could turn off the, like, enemies and the mm. ghouls, it would be my perfect game. <laughs> I read a brief review that said it was a game about a postman, which I thought yes. was bold. <laughs> no, it is. Like, I actually think that's way more interesting. Like, you know, connecting people in a world, I think, is just actually a much more interesting thing to do than to tote your gun from place to place. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, again... Um, Have you ever worked on a game with combat in? Uh, Horizon Zero Dawn. Ah, yes. Right, okay. Uh, I wrote loads of combat books. <laughs> that's in fact. <laughs> that was really exciting for me. Aloy's combat books. Um, and, you know, when she sets traps and things, Rob, my partner Rob also works in video games and had worked in the studio system before. <laughs> and had to explain. It's like, no, you can't make them too memorable, Meg. And I was like, but... Isn't that the job of the writer? Mm. I was like, no, these are going to be repeated. I, I love that they hired the writer of 80 Days to do this. I just have this image of Aloy stalking through the place and saying, that's a jolly large. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Pass part two, fetch my bathroom. <laughs> Bugger me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, the thing is, uh, what happened was I, I, I was really hired to do world building, which, which I did, but they, you know, I think, uh, again, I, I, I was hired about a year before launch. And I think I hadn't realized that on a project of that scale, a year before launch is, is, is late. Mm, yeah, <laughs> you know, a lot of things have already been kind of set in stone. So in fact, um, you know, some of my work was in, in the DLC as well. But, but so what happened was I, I did as much kind of world building as needed at the time. And then I think I still had a little more time with them. And, and you know, and so, yeah, I added flavor to, to kind of add to Aloy, which was, it was, I mean, it was really interesting. It's a kind of, it's a skill that I think, I am strange in the games industry as a, as a writer and narrative designer for only having done sort of three years into my career. Mm. I think a lot of people start out, you know. I genuinely you know. have never written any dialogue box at all. And not even for, oh yeah. Oh, can we talk about your, you, you writing the, um, the, the promo for that? Did, didn't you write a, pro, a, a promo for a conference recently? <laughs> I thought you did. I don't know what you're talking about. For an about. action game. Anyway, we shan't say anything about it. But oh, that! Yes, yes. Oh, yes, that. No, I didn't. They, they, it was oh, you a, didn't write the book. No, it was a... No, it was... No, I didn't. I, I, <laughs> no, they had a script and they were non-English speakers and they wanted to make it more English. Yes. So I made it more English and I also made it slightly less 80s American action film because it was yeah. a bit awful. Um, <laughs> I don't know if they used my edit, though. I, I, no, this, very, is, this, very is, this is the fun thing, I, you know, that one doesn't always... I mean, I think that's... That's, that's in some ways the really nice thing about working in, in indie mm. is that you generally you are actually doing know. it <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. You, you sort of know whether it's your work or whether they got someone else in to just edit you out yeah. at the last minute yeah. so um you said there that you worked on world building mm. is that not plotting is that yeah well to my eyes to my eyes it is and mm. i think you know i i you know, that, that, I mean, that's kind of my process in, in a way. But I, I recognize it's kind of, you know, it's something that's harder to do as a contractor coming in externally, I think, mm. you know, um, if you're not in from a very early point in the project. you just don't get the power to make big decisions. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, so, so it was hard as well, you know, so, so things like if you had to be right the main quest, you had to be on site in Amsterdam, which I work remotely generally. And it's a kind of visa nightmare because I'm an Indian citizen. So, uh, you know, so that didn't really happen. Um, you know, so it kind of meant that, that your access to kind of all of the avenues through which the player is experiencing story is limited. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of sort of background conversation and, and kind of, you know, character moments and stuff like that. But um, 
Yeah, my, my brief experience of writing a quest for a AAA company remotely was they said, could you write a quest for this character? I said, what can this character do? Right. And they said the usual things in the game. <laughs> like, <laughs> what is that? And they were like, you know, walk around. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, but I mean, that's int- But I think, you know, in a way, Heaven's Fall is a game about walking around and it's fascinating. Well, right? You know? Yeah, I, it's mostly a, a game about conversation, I think. Yes. That's right. the core thing. Um, so I mean, walking around and having conversations is pretty much what most of us do for fun, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, well, it's the majority of all drama on TV. <laughs> right. as well. One like, can only imagine. One yeah. kind of hopes that dialogue could convey meaning somewhere along the way. <laughs> Um, I mean, I often I try and avoid dialogue as possible. So Sable is Sable is there is some reported speech, but it's also got some internal narration as well because hmm. you know, which I think is is sort of I hope won't be too weird in a in a kind of open world Zelda like game like hmm. that. But it just allows you for so much because it's it's sort of set in the future. It's kind of it's not dystopian. It's not apocalyptic per se, but it is kind of on an alien planet. And um, it's alien cultures and trying to convey kind of the new... I, don't, I think it's very hard to find a, a not clunky way for a person to explain their entire cultural ideology to you um, up front it, using words, mm-hmm. especially when you're supposed to be from that culture. So the so, problem really is, is one of exposition in kind of a very alien I think, environment. I think it's exposition, but I think it's also what, what people say is, is, not, is not the... You know, the thing is, I think it's it's when you're setting something in the real world, or I think someone more familiar, or if, I think you know, in, in some ways, Heaven's Vault has this structure of the university is a familiar archetype. Do you know what I mean? So that gives that that gives people a sense of purchase and and the kind of sense of of archaeology. And I think we don't really have that in Sable. Mm. It's just completely. Strange. It's so different. It's yeah. so different. I mean, and it's a you know, it's deliberately kind of. You know, it's a, it's a kind of vision of a future that is not capitalist and where war is not a main driver of conflict, where resource scarcity is not a main driver of conflict. Um, but you still need drama and tension and you still need characters, but there is no shorthand, I suppose. Also, everyone wears masks. I should have mentioned that. Mm. So there's a certain extent to which you know, the inhumanity of these characters who are already alien, who are already from a different culture, is not leavened by having them smile at you <laughs> or having any kind of, you know. But I actually think in, in some ways it helps because I, I kind of think you avoid the issue of, God, it's so expensive to make beautiful facial <laughs> animations. Yeah. You know, so, so yeah, it was, it, was, it, was a technical, it was a technical choice. That so the kind of the use of, the use of prose in Sable yes. as above character above dialogue is so that you can kind of more directly communicate with the yeah, player. Yeah, and I, yes. And get them to really empathise and understand the people. Absolutely, and I think Sable interprets people for them. So Sable's yeah. impressions of people help you contextualise Sable them. the main character. Sable the main character, yes, exactly. Yeah, okay. Well, I had I had written down, actually, as, as a question, do you prefer prose or dialogue? Because obviously prose, we obviously. work with prose, obviously. <laughs> right, okay. Well, I don't understand people. I, I mean, I, I deeply admire people who love to, Like, I think... You know, again, this is not going to be revolutionary. Like Phoebe Waller Bridge's dialogue in Fleet, like it's 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 amazing. Like her ability to kind of create pace, which again is something that I think you talked about was 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 your talk here last year, the Sparking Dialogue talk, yeah. Yeah. which is all about pace, I think, and I think one of the hardest things to do mm-hmm. in in what in what we do. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, Heaven's Vault for me was, uh, you know, it's a dialogue driven game yes. and I kind of wanted it to be entirely dialogue if at all possible. And I had to basically learn how to do that because <laughs> I came from a prose background, yeah. just, just as you did. And the exposition problem is unbelievably hard and gave me a lot more respect for writers on things like Star Trek and stuff like that. Because they, they write this exposition and yeah. give it to actors who can deliver it without you noticing that what they're well, saying is intrinsically I, I, boring. I think <laughs> so. So I think here is one of the things because I, I also, you know, I, I studied, I, I did theatre at university and, and I went to film school and I have to tell you one of the things that we are missing out on as games writers is the enormous advantage that an act, a good actor who inhabits your character, I mean of course you will have known this from the voiceover work you did with, with oh, Aaliyah. We added it at the very last minute and like, was stunned by the It's amazing it, yeah. isn't it? Like someone just reading a piece of exposition is horrifically boring and the actor is, my God, man, an actor making your words sound better. Like, it's just, it's, it's kind of amazing because I think I am often, especially in, in kind of, the bigger the studio that you're working for, the, the bigger the concept, you, I feel like often the challenge is to write something that is good enough that it can be made 
sort of 10% less good and then 10% less good. Not that people are making it less good, but there's so many other things the player is asked to focus on. There's so many layers it has to go through. There's so many other people it has to kind of communicate through and so many systems it has to touch that it kind of has to be so good at the beginning to kind of take the to degradation survive to the survive that it's going to go exactly down, yeah. and and you know having an actor's voice come back in can actually push kick, kick some it of the back life up again at the last minute in. Yeah, i agree that, i think that, so that totally makes sense so i guess that touches not that on... we'll be having voiceover on sable but you know <laughs> <laughs> it's fine but i mean reading out prose is pretty bad so that's a good <laughs> um so that kind of brings me to a, another question that i think is interesting at the at the top of the talk, I mentioned mm -hmm. in passing that you were listed as the as the narrative designer of 80 Days, <laughs> yeah. and I was listed as the writer of Heaven's Vault. And reading that made me <laughs> so funny. ask myself, a, it, I mean, yeah. absolute respect to the team behind Adventure X. I think they're all brilliant. Um, but it made me ask myself a question, which I've never asked before, mm. which is we often talk about ourselves. I think you say this in your bio. I'm sure I do in mine. Writer and narrative designer. I, and I suddenly say thought, narrative designer. Right. Are, those, are they different jobs or yeah. what? No, I don't think they are. I don't think it can be. Well... No, I think it depends on the kind of game you're making, sure. I suppose. Because I think if you are making, you know, a, a kind of a last of us, um, you know, something that is deeply cinematic, then, you know, the rules of the rules of broadcast apply. Mm -hmm. And and I think, you know, those, those are wonderful cinematic games and they're beautifully written. And there's a lot of design work to make it, you know. And I think the, the interaction and the cleverness is in is in the design work that goes into making you feel like you're inside this amazing mm -hmm. sort of cinematic action moment. Um, but anything that requires, I don't know, anything that is, is more game, anything that is branchy, anything that, that I, I, I do think that there is a, an amount of design work that goes mm -hmm. into it. Do you think that, I guess the thing that puzzled me about it was I started to think, I wonder if playwrights do design work to make their scenes work. And I bet they do, actually. So depending, it depends. Like, often that's a... So <laughs> you're probably thinking of a, a writer-director. A a, we all love writer-directors in the theatre. Uh, they're almost never there for just well, the ego They're half the price, purpose. aren't they, of a right. writer and a director. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, like, when, um, so like when I, I... You know, my friends are directors. There's a, there's a necessity for you as a director, as a playwright, to kind of understand how the lighting rig works, what kind of stage you're on, mm. the, the affordances of the tools mm -hmm. that you can use. Sounds... But you don't necessarily need to be able to light or rig yourself. Mm. And I think it's, it's kind of similar mm -hmm. for us too, in that I think that you're... I, I feel like actually you're a narrative designer, but you're also a, writing ink. You know, ink, I think, is a language, is a, is a completely separate skill. Mm. And it's it's no it's one that I um sort of I feel like is slightly magical. <laughs> I kind of understand enough to use it to make it do what I want, and occasionally I'm like, oh look, here's an interesting thing, but uh, but that's a very very different skill to mm. to what you so, do. So I mean, ink is a ink is a scripting language that kind of allows the writer to really do the logic at the same time as writing, which some writers find very, very terrifying, mm. basically. It's far too much control or something, mm. I don't know. Um, as the people who make ink, which is free, I'm not trying to sell you anything, um, we're in this privileged position where we occasionally get to see other people's bits of ink because yes. they'll send it to us yes. for various reasons. So you occasionally see some really beautiful yeah. uses of ink, and you see a lot of incredibly ugly uses of ink, which kind of are toe curling. <laughs> and it, it's sort of... <laughs> It, it, it kind of... I mean, even my indentations used to bother you, oh, as God, I recall. Oh, God, they were so bad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's just that I wouldn't tower... I don't know, is this, is this something from programming where you're, you're meant to, like, all of your indentations need to be, like, perfectly oh, yeah. Most programming aligned. languages automatically indent to right. show you the structure of the thing, and we don't. You, we leave it up to you, but if you get it wrong, it does go wrong, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> no, it still, it still works, technically, but I think it was just less easy for you to work. read. You, you, so ink is all about having the right number of asterisks on your yes. subheadings, and you used to just make it up after a while oh, and I think it was I mean a little bit deep in yeah absolutely. I think it was because you were copying not copying and pasting but cutting and pasting and moving things around and actually yeah, yeah, it is yeah. annoying <laughs> moving a sub block to a main block and then having to adjust all the stars and I can understand that you can't be bothered so I but thank um, you now for getting rid of the asterisks now I have to use pluses that's not weird in Twilight Zone it's on the context <laughs> <laughs> yeah so I guess that that made me wonder about a question which is do you think as writer narrative designers <laughs> yeah. um can we ever specialize or do we have to just be able to do everything? I mean, no, I think of course you specialize. Like I think there's particular, I think of course there are particular kinds of games that you all, but I feel like, you know, I would do a much worse job on Halo. 
<laughs> than anyone working on it currently. You know right. what I mean? Like, and, and I think can, they would probably do, have done a much worse job in 80 days as well. Mm -hmm. And that isn't to say that each of those things aren't perfectly valid. But, but I, you know, I, 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 I think that you would be wasted on writing something more linear. I think, you know, the kind of the skill, what, the way your brain works, I think, allows you to do something that's particularly interesting. And I think <laughs> that's what you should be doing. OK, thank you for my well, advice, Mum. I appreciate <laughs> well, yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> now that you're here in the office, I mean, good. Yeah, exactly. Uh, we must be running towards the end of our time, which I don't have an eyeball on at all. Mm. Tom, how, how long have we got? Um, I think we've got one lunch at one o'clock. Oh, yeah. amazing. Oh, well, we're carrying yeah. on going then. Brilliant. Again, again I guess yeah. what? Yeah. Ah, yeah, I mean, I also think specialism is a weird thing, right? Like, because it's. I mean, are we talking about technical specialisms? Are we talking about understanding kind of the, or is it theme? Is it, you know, I, I think I guess, I'm, I'm... I guess my question is, <coughs> is it sustainable for writers to be like auteurs who control every aspect of the process from the, yeah. from the bottom to the top? I mean, obviously, I run a tiny indie studio, so I quite often find myself in that situation. Yeah. But I dream of having a team of seven people Do where you? someone does the words and someone does the programming. And really? But, is but that you would possible? be able to give up the words? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's more a political issue, I think. But like, do you think, do you think that's something we can, we can do? Can we work in teams successfully? Or do we lose something when we do that? I, you know, you know I, love, I love working in teams. I loved working with you guys. And I think, actually, you don't, and it's a feeling that I feel I have with, with Shedworks as well on Sable that feeling of working with people who are so good at what they do that you can actually just worry about. And maybe this is because you were, you, you were part of Inkle and I was the contractor, but there's a freedom you gave me to go, I can just do focus on doing my job really well and trust that everyone is going to be doing their job really well. Mm -hmm. So they will be making my work better. And whenever I have the time or bandwidth, I can kind of lean over and it was hip chat rather than Slack at the time and like kind of lean over into the chat and talk to you about design stuff or like kind of dip into whatever conversation was going on. But at times where I was busy with writing, I could just kind of completely disappear away from that mm -hmm. and just go off and do my thing and, and just trust that you were going to be doing something great. I mean, you know, similarly on, on Sable, I've, I've got, you know, um, Greg Kerthiotis and, and, and Dan Feinberg who are like the co-founders of the company. And Greg comes from an architecture background <laughs> and is making all of these like beautiful architecturally designed spaces and sable. And, you know, I, I wrote two paragraphs like six months ago about the social, the cultural kind of makeup of this clan. And, he, and you know, Greg's come back with it. Oh, right. So that means that they're all co-sleeping at this point. So they'll have a central <laughs> structure. And I'm just like, great, wonderful. I, you know, this is, it's just, it's really nice to just kind of, to, I think, for me, as, as someone contracting, I guess it's really nice to kind of be able to step in as much as you want, mm -hmm. but also be able to step back and just focus on your own thing. But I think it's a different problem for you because I think now it's, you're more in control of, you know, I suppose it's, it's what kind of games you want to make. <laughs> uh, I, I find my problem is I keep making games that I don't know how to make and then I, it's very hard to bring someone in because you don't know how to do yeah, it. Yeah, that's true. So I, I think that I, Sable, had no idea how little I knew how to do <laughs> this game when they hired me. Uh, and, you know, <laughs> they'll so find out now. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think I've already said this to them. It's like, wow, okay, I think I finally know I started working on it in November. Mm. Just like, right, I think I finally have started to understand the game that we're making. Mm. I'm so glad you had no idea <laughs> about this beforehand. We'll, but we'll see, yeah. So, I mean, if you can talk about that in a bit mm. more detail. When you started on Sable, obviously, yeah. they had the, the visual look of it, and I guess they had a lot of ideas about the tone and the world. What was your, what was your way into that project? What did you do first? So they had a massive game design document um, that was like 60 pages long. That that had all of the areas, like huge ideas for, for places and spaces. But of course, as usual, anyone who's been kind of working on a world for several years, I think, which I think they had, most of it was in their heads. Mm. So it was a real process of kind of, I would suggest something, they go, ah, but actually, and then, you know, tell me a whole bunch of lore. Mm. Um, so it was, so I it's think, a bit like working for Tolkien, basically. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, don't even say that. Uh, no, but I think, I think weirdly we were both very, very eager to give each other space mm -hmm. um, to explore. So in a way, it goes back to kind of what I was saying earlier, which is what I really learned was someone has to make a decision, even if it's, even if it's not the best decision. A decision is better mm -hmm. than the best decision, mm -hmm. even. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I think 
I think, I think it was a, a real process of, I think, both of us finding out where the boundaries were, what kind of game they envisioned it to be. And now that I was coming in to take over a huge amount, you know, to basically take over narrative, mm. what kind of game I wanted it to be and where, how we could, where, where the sort of Venn diagram crossover bit was. Yeah. And ideally, most of us, <laughs> most of the time, we should be working towards that bit. Yeah, yeah. Um, you, you only know, want to that, fight over the bits that are really important. Right, exactly. And, and kind of, I think also, you know, for me, things like, you know, very simple things like resourcing was um, a really big, big thing to learn because, you know, when I was working on Horizon Zero Dawn, you're writing into a format, you know, I couldn't say, and Aloy encounters a dragon. Mm. It, you know, <laughs> Aloy encountered what she encountered. You know, I wasn't really in charge of any of that. And on 80 days, I could literally make up anything I wanted mm, yeah. <laughs> uh, because it's prose and that's great. Um, so I think as well, you know, understanding what this particular team does, because they were like, oh, no, definitely not fire, but smoke. That's great. And, you know, it's like, <laughs> like things like that, what your engine can do, what they're comfortable doing, the kinds of mechanical affordances. you. It's that classic thing from film. I think about it a lot. The uh, And then an army comes over the horizon <laughs> that you're not allowed to write in a screenplay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, so this is the really lovely thing about prose as well, because, you know, we have an ability to just kind of, you know, cut away to a very sort of artistic shot of like something nearby. And it's like the town erupted into cheers. <laughs> yes. Yeah, there we go. Or, or flames is happening flames. quite a lot in exactly. it. Right. <laughs> yeah. right. Yeah, exactly. No, I think fewer towns will erupt into flames than did in 80 days. I think. Okay. Okay. I think um, one of the things I thought was interesting about what I've seen of Sable, and I've, I've seen a little bit more mm. than the general public, yes. but not very much more, um, is that it's, it's inherently... There's definitely loads more. Yes. <laughs> definitely. Um, it's, in, it's very inherently non-linear. It's mm. a very open environment that you yeah. can explore. So um, you were talking about the kind of weight of exposition and yes. the strangeness of the world. So in Heaven's Vault is an open environment, but we we worked very hard to kind of stage manage the intro so yes. as to develop concepts quite slowly and build people up before we let them go. Because I was right. re <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's sort of a tutorial and it's sort of like yeah. season one or something. Right, exactly. It's a um, narrative tutorial. And I think, I think that that's the thing. Um, that was what I was really keen on in 80 Days as well. I didn't want us to linger over and belabor this idea of like, you know, God, why is Passport 2 being hired? Why does, do I, why does he care about this? Why does Fog care about this? No, we are in, you're hired, we're going. You know, and then you kind of, you can like ask some of your bewildered questions on the way, but you know everything you need to know in a, in a very short time. And, um, and I think I, it, that's what I st I'm striving for in Sable, but it's really hard because I think there's at least four core concepts that are quite strange concepts. Like what, you know, why is everyone masked? Where are we? Uh, what is the gliding? Which is a, it's a kind of, it's a, it's a, it's a sort of walkabout. It's a, it's a coming of age ritual where everyone in this society goes out into the world and they can try on different masks from different sort of professions and different different areas for the first time during the gliding and then at the end of the gliding they decide when it is mm. they take up one mask and it's one mask was this the, was this the initial lives. concept or was this no, something that you no, no. so this that, that was me so everyone being masked was the design problem <laughs> right yeah. Yeah. And this is the solution <laughs> yes. to that problem yes, yes, yeah exactly um you know so it's a little it's kind of yeah, so all of that, you know, you need to know quite a few things in order to even just start enjoying the world. Uh, that's not fun. So I'm, I'm writing the tutorial at the moment, but I'm writing it assuming that whenever it seems an opposite moment to kind of explain a big concept, I do. But otherwise, I kind of assume that I'll have explained it before now, mm. somehow. <laughs> are, you, are you kind of interested in in developing those things as actual mysteries for the player to discover? Uh, so, so I think there's lots of things that are... No, so, so I think why the player is there, I want them to be really clear on. Really solid. <laughs> but, so, I mean, essentially, it's, it's UCAS. It's kind of UCAS. It's just, it's uni. It's a gap year mm. is really what it is. Mm. Um, a gap year for, for oh gosh, non-Western non people. Um, but like, uh, yeah, and I think, I think with Heaven's Vault, what's really interesting about it, it's almost, I feel like Sable and Heaven's Vault are sort of doing inverse things in some ways, and they're strangely similar in others. But in Heaven's Vault, it's all about, it's very archaeological, and I think Sable is kind of, um, is not archaeological at all. There are all of these ruins. So Greg and I have this process where, um, you, know, I, you know, I send him concepts for the clans, then he sort of comes up with, a ruin and will give me a few cryptic hints about why it's shaped the way it is. Mm. But I just come up with Sable's ignorant layperson, nomadic era 
thousand years later understanding of what right. this place is. Yeah. And it doesn't matter. And it's even, it, you know, it adds a layer for people who are like, oh no, this is clearly a this, you know, if they understand anything about architecture or, or urban design or anything like that. But, but it, it's quite fun. And I think I'm going to find out about a lot of things afterwards, but I think it's almost, it's quite a nice process. I think that's wonderful. That, that's, <laughs> it's really nice. it's, like, it's, it's a subgenre of apocalyptic fiction, isn't yeah. it? The people misunderstanding right. what a ruin it is, is it, and then um, running with it. And who's so, right? The people in the past or the people right, in the present? So one of our real, one of our real touchstones is um, the play Mr. Burns, which I don't know if you're familiar with, I but know. is it was playing across from our hotel, my hotel, the first year we went to GDC, which we went with for with 80 days. Um, and it is a show about, um, it's, it, it moves, every kind of act moves you 500 years and then I think another 500 years or 1,000 years in the future. And it starts out with a Simpsons episode. And then 500 years later, that Simpsons episode is ritually recalled around a campfire and becomes part of this future culture's mythology. And then 1,000 years later, there are just these weird masks that only very slightly look like Simpsons characters, but they've become totemic figures or like mythological kind of yellow-faced, like pointy-haired <laughs> figures. And, and it's it kind of, so it's, it's, it's all about just that expansion expansiveness and the retelling of stories and kind of going from an era of of, of kind of, of of known to the unknown via mythology and I think that's that's kind of where we want to be with Sable. That sounds fantastic. fantastic. <laughs> I mean you had to make up you had to actually know what really was, had happened in your world whereas I don't it's a real it's so <laughs> freeing in a way. You just get to be the the ignorant. <laughs> yeah exactly just like <laughs> well, what's around. this oh who cares. It's kind of an, ex, an, ex, uh, an like, adventure very, anti world building. It's a very teenage thing as well I remember my parents built a house which is a thing that's more common I think outside of the west where here largely you don't build your own they house. They got a lot in Finland and Sweden. Ah right yeah exactly so you have a plot of land and you build your house and my parents every day after school would take me to the stupid part of land I mean now it's, it's like <laughs> they live there it's my I really love going there but um for three years after school they'd made me spend it I eventually I refused to even come inside and look at the advancements in the house uh, look at the tiling the grouting's going well things that a 15 year old could not give a shit about honestly <laughs> and I would just sit in the car and listen to music and just sort of angrily and now I'm I really want to know about everything that went into this house and it, it's almost 10 years later, a process of rediscovery. And my mom was like, we told you about all of this. And I was like, no, I had my headphones in the whole time. I don't, didn't care. And you do care about these things when you're older, I think. But Sable is at that point where she's really focused on, God, what am I going to do with my life? And is my family going to be disappointed? And am I going to pick something? And, or I, and am I going to be happy? Or am I going to regret all of my choices from here on? Yes. And I think that's a real, it's a real moment <laughs> that I think is... I think for me, that's the human moment in, because I think lots of us have that moment the first time you leave home or, you know, go away to school or go away with your friends. You know, that's that start living as an adult. I, I, I kind of love the description of building this entire beautiful, gorgeous <laughs> world with thousands of years of history just to let yeah. loose some teenager in it. I mean, I don't know what's going on. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> there are adults. You do meet them. Yeah. They do occasionally no more but. but i guess that goes back to the thing that you said right at the start about yeah. point of view isn't yes. it it's it's so much about seeing the point of view of the yeah the character and bringing that to life so i think that's that's a rather lovely way to bring that craft discussion full circle at just about the right point yeah, in time. Exactly. so um there's a million other things yeah. that we could talk about we haven't talked at all about the state of the games industry and all the kind of advocacy and mm. uh welcoming of a wider mm. community work that you are getting really quite a reputation <laughs> But being That's very really, good at it's it. It's very, very amusing. I mean, so I, I hosted the IGF Awards this year, which was really wonderful. And, um, you know, it was, I mean, what was really, it was, it was also a really tough time. I had my long dark night of the soul because the week before was the Christchurch shooting. And I was in America at the time, <clears throat> uh, you know, and, and I had a real moment where I stayed up that whole night and I just thought, God, do, is this really the industry that I want to be in? If I, you know, if I was a novelist, would... Would, would a famous sort of novel reviewer's name be shouted by someone who's murdering someone? Mm. I don't think so. It's, it's a weird proximity to be in. It's never, you know, it's, it's an unfortunate reality of our industry, I think. Um, you know, but then I talked to lots of friends and, and particularly lots of, lots of women of color and, 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 you know, marginalized folks in the industry. And what most of them said was, and I think it was actually Naomi Alderman who said this to me, and she said, she tweeted about this, and she was like, if we give up this space to them, then then we, we, we're giving it up. If we, if we step back, we're ceding it to them. And so it fe felt like, 
you know, a weird... It felt weird. It felt strangely important to be present, to be there, and to say something about it. And I think, in some ways, we can underestimate the value of, of just our presence and 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 that a a statement. And I think it was probably, you know, I have to say to to GDC's credit, they didn't edit a single word, or they suggest they gave me another thirty seconds, though they did cut down my time, um, and and sort of allowed me and just asked me to put you know, a joke back in, which was fair enough mm. after some pretty heavy, heavy, heavy stuff. But, you know, I think I think it was valuable. I think it was important. I got to give my very first award to Bahia for After Hours, which I think is being shown here. Um, and Bahia's on Sky. <laughs> She's like hangout singing, which I think is an amazing format, by the way, and other conferences should do that, mm -hmm. um, you know, because Bahia is based in South Africa. So as a woman of color, and I was the first I think I was the first person of color to host the IGF Awards. I, it's definitely the first woman of color to do it. I got to give another award to a woman of color. And, you know, she and I, I she, she said, thank you so much for saying that as a Muslim to me. And I was, I was so shocked by that because I was like, this is her, this moment of triumph. She's won this award. And she's just sort of grateful that I've said something about an enormous tragedy that involves all of us and, and an issue that, that is, is kind of hugely important. And, and I think the absence of that on that stage would have been really glaring. Mm. And, and so I'm, I'm glad it wasn't. But yeah, I think that's, a, that's been my real focus, making, making the industry feel welcoming. And, and you know, I think you probably, you know, we're not going to really get into it, but as well, all of the, the recent Me Too movement in the industry, which I think has been, has been really amazing. Uh, I ended up slightly more personally involved in it than I thought I would be. Um, you know, but it's, uh, I think it's, an, it, again, these are unfortunate realities. These are unfortunate realities. And if we don't look at them and if we don't face them and if we don't deal with them, it's never going to change and it's never going to get better. And I've spent so much time saying to women and people of color and marginalized folks, like, you know, come, come be part of the games industry. Come, we need your voice. But, you know, can you in good conscience say, come, come to this industry. It's so wonderful. You'll be... <laughs> you know, harassed, doxxed, <laughs> threatened. Yeah. Um, you know, you won't have all of these opportunities. So, so I think it's it's instead of asking, you know, how do we get more people in the industry? How do we how do we get more diverse voices in the room? I think it's how do how do we make people who are already here feel welcome? How do we make sure if we make our industry a welcoming place, and if it's clearly a welcoming place, then they will come. <laughs> you know, because I, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> I think um, you already know that I massively respect you as a writer and a designer, and I think hiring you for 80 Days was one of the best decisions I've made in my entire artistic life, which was on the basis of not much evidence at the time. No, not really. Um, you played so some I, Sora. Yeah. I think I sent you a nice letter about the combat in Sorcery, and so you, you did. thought I... Yes, you were charming. Um, <laughs> but I... And also, I don't think anyone else had said anything about it. No, then they were foolish. Um, so I'm, you you know, I'm very proud of that for myself, but I oh, think... John. On behalf of lots of people, I think we, you know, I think a lot of people are incredibly grateful for the stance that you've been taking. And I think we're very aware of how visible that has been and how exposed that has been. And it is entirely unfair that that falls as a burden on a woman of colour. Yeah. Whether that, that seems to happen a lot, and I can't <laughs> yeah. quite work out why, but there we go. Uh, um, yeah. I mean, but, you know, I should say as well, I think the real difference between now and what happened now and four years ago, and I think it's important to remember that, is that largely speaking, all of my colleagues, ev everyone in the industry, anyone of note, really, um, was on our side, believed us. Yeah, and I think true. believed largely everyone. And I think the atmosphere entirely had changed. Mm -hmm. We no longer have this, oh, he said, she said, two sides to every debate. The industry has moved forward. No one wants to go back into that time because I think we all recognize that Gamergate was not was, was not about ethics and games journalism. It was not a healthy it was not a healthy way to go. And we're seeing it seep out into into our actual real world. Real yes. world politics. Yeah. Because our world is the real world and actually the games industry is again so and, and I kinda wanna say I think to me this is a it's yes it's a gendered issue, but it's also kind of a, a workers' rights issue for me. And I think it's you know it's a factor of 
you know, being freelance, being remote, being exploited, being, you know, crunched, not being able to have financial security, all of these things combine to create an atmosphere in which I'm feeling tough. awful about it. <laughs> <We're laughs> uh, uh, no, but, but I, think, I think what's really good about it is, is seeing how different things are mm. and how the standards have changed. Yes, it's hard to change them, but, but I think now we want our industry to be a welcoming place to women. We want an industry free of harassers. Mm. And, you know, apart from a few sort of, you, you know, teenage boys who are still living in their parents' bedrooms and a few people still lurking on, on you know, not very active parts of the internet, the conversation has, has moved on. I think certainly the atmosphere around the recent Games Me Too movement was one where the industry was efficiently, quickly, and even somewhat vocally for the games industry yes. on the right side, which is... I agree. Yeah, that was I think so, and I think, I, you know, what I've realised is also there are now so many more, you know, it's not... I feel like I'm in a... Well, I feel like my platform at the IGF Awards was also partly what led me to, to kind of come out first, I think. And, and I, Yeah, exactly, because I think, you know, what other greater stamp of sort of approval could you get from the industry? And if you don't use it, use that for something worthwhile, then what are you doing here? I suppose is my opinion. But Well, I think we, we need to wrap it <laughs> yes, up. We but should. I think on behalf of lots of people, I would oh. like to thank you for the bravery that you expressed in that for the use of your platform but also for the clarity of thought that you always give to these issues because I think that's really helped a lot of people who couldn't quite see how it all fitted together really really understand it and I think that's that's an incredible thing but I'm actually more interested to play Sable than talk about this anymore. So. Yeah exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks very much.